Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. My special guest today really needs little introduction to the U.S. Farm Report audience. Devon Woodland has been on our show a number of times, and it's always a pleasure to welcome him back. Devon, good to see you. Thank you, Will. Devon, by the way, is executive assistant to the field staff department of the National Farmers Organization and comes from the great northwest, the state of Idaho. How many states are you covering up there now for NFO? I'm covering uh, five states, Bill. There's Idaho, Utah, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and parts of Wyoming. As uh, most of our viewers realize, Devon, uh, our U.S. Farm Report crew made a field trip up into your northwestern territory. Unfortunately, you were gone. At least our paths did not cross while we were there. But up in your country and in the state of California, we saw some uh, evidence of uh, tremendous efficiency in big farming. And yet, at the same time, everywhere we went, uh, the farmers seemed to say five times nothing is still nothing, 20 times nothing is still nothing. Efficiency just isn't the whole answer, is it? It certainly isn't, Bill. And those who think that it is on these figures that you have mentioned have simply forgotten their grade school arithmetic. The, uh, the cry has been uttered by those who are unrelated to agriculture that this is the solution, efficiency, which is untrue. It just simply isn't. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how big an operation you get, and uh, many of the people have tried this as a solution, uh, if you continue to sell below cost, it doesn't matter how much you have, the more you have, the faster you're going to go broke. That seems to be it. It's just uh, this common. Yeah. Devon, in the Northwest, in what crop categories do you find the biggest farming, the biggest efficiency? I think that we could probably uh, confine this to uh, the two crops, particularly the wheat, because this has been a tremendous squeeze on the wheat producers. Mm -hmm. And then also in the potatoes, because they have been forced to uh, improve their efficiency. And they've been successful in this. And uh, we must always encourage our people to be efficient, to use the latest land practices and farming methods. Uh, we would be unwise to, uh, to think otherwise. But still, this just simply doesn't, uh, doesn't solve the problem, Bill. Well, when you speak these days in farming of efficiency, uh, you actually are talking in terms, in most instances, of modern equipment, aren't you? This is right. This is the way you get efficiency, this through the right. use of modern equipment. To eliminate manpower. Yes. And so this efficiency thing becomes a very costly thing. This is true. Now, I know that on our trip to the Northwest, some of the equipment being used in the harvesting of potatoes, for example, was, uh, was very expensive equipment. And uh, these potato farmers uh, really had a tremendous investment in it. And yet they had no price for the potatoes. This is true. It isn't unusual for these fellows to get $100,000 to $150,000 invested in just uh, harvesting equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very common. Mm -hmm. And uh, out on the big dry farms, why they've got these uh, mammoth tractors, uh, they will uh, hook their equipment together and uh, trying to uh, become more efficient. And uh, this has uh, had to be done out of necessity. Yes. I would presume that <clears throat> irrigation has to be considered an effort toward more efficiency, too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, of course, uh, through your part of the country, there's a great deal of irrigation. This is right. In our area, this is uh, nearly exclusive. Of course, to, up in the outlying areas, well, then it moves into the dry farm type of thing. Uh, but the farmer, Bill, has actually become the victim of his own efficiency. He has increased his efficiency, uh, his output per man hour. And uh, he's become the victim of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's a sad thing uh, that he's uh, been uh, moved or pushed into this direction to where he's actually uh, uh, created a, a very unfavorable situation for himself. He's uh, been able to produce now uh, perhaps 300 percent more than he did uh, 20 years ago. He was providing for about seven people 20 years ago per man on the farm, and today he's up to as high as 20, 21. And so he has become efficient, uh, perhaps uh, twice as efficient as any other industry that we know of. 
and still they're saying, uh, uh, produce more for less. Mm -hmm. In other words, they've got us on this treadmill, yes. like the squirrel that you see in the museum. The faster he runs, he just sits right there. Yes. And uh, so there must be another solution, and we think that we have found it. And it must come through uh, the collective bargaining program that we, uh, that we endorse and encourage. Bill, one of the things that impressed me is I have had the opportunity of going in and visiting with many of the, uh, the large processors who not only process, but they also produce. And nearly invariably, they will tell me that their ability to market, they have the ability to uh, search out the markets, mm -hmm. to place their commodity, is where they can excel over above the individual. Yeah. They tell me that their ability to produce uh, or being efficient is no greater than the individual. But uh, their ability to market is where they have the margin. Mm -hmm. And because of this now, uh, you can see how insignificant their ability as a, a processor will be to market when we are successful in our marketing program. Right. We ran into an outstanding example of farming efficiency in the Shandon, California area. Now, I know this is not in your territory right. that you work, but I'm sure you're acquainted with that area of rolling hill country. So at this time, uh, I'd like for you to join me, and we'll invite our audience to do the same, to the Marion White Ranch near Shandon, California. The farmland rolls gently from the Sierras down toward the sea. This is big farm country, where single pieces of property are measured in thousands of acres, but where high efficiency hasn't yet brought a fair price to the farmer. Last fall, our U.S. Farm Report crew stopped at Shandon to visit the farm of two brothers, NFO members George and Marion White. I talked with Marion about the special equipment he needs and the special problems he faces on a large farm. Marion, it would appear to me, seeing these rolling hills as your ranching terrain, that the equipment that you use to farm here must be, uh, if not specially manufactured, it must be very sharply modified after you buy it. That's uh, certainly true. Uh, due to the, the hilly terrain and rough areas that we farm, steep some up to maybe oh, more than 42 percent uh, grades, we do have to have specially equip equipment. It's just to be extra strength in hitches and other pieces uh, that show uh, tremendous strain in this type of an operation. Now, this is a this particular piece of equipment here is a is a press grain drill, and it's probably we feel it's one of the best investments we've made in recent years because of the fact that it has increased our production due to the fact of dropping the seed in with the fertilizer and uh, it also is a tool will do some cultivating if it comes necessary that we're seeding after rain. Uh -huh. What do you pull this with? How, how big a tractor is this? Uh, this uh, there's 42 feet of drill here, 314s, and it's pulled with a 13A D8. Uh, it's rated at 150 horsepower. This uh, tractor was uh, purchased in uh, 1954 and uh, you can see that we were thinking of uh, bigger hitches in years back. Mm -hmm. Now this hitch on which we're sitting is what, the largest uh, commercially manufactured hitch? Yes, uh, to my knowledge, this uh, hitch is it's about the limit, a 42-foot uh, implement. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's called a multi-hitch, and it's designed with hinges on the wings for uh, uneven terrain. What kind of an investment in terms of replacement uh, do you feel you have here? Well, this particular drill, right today I wouldn't be sure of the price, but at the time we purchased it in uh, 1963, was at a cost of $12,000, ready to go as you see it today. Then you add tractor cost. Well, the tractor is an old machine, and we got it a bargain. We only paid $21,795 <laughs> for it. <laughs> So at least you have uh, quite an investment. That's right here true. In, in uh, today, the tractor, if you found the right fellow, it might be worth eight or ten thousand yeah. in a trade-in. Now, you have a, a new truck. It's a brand new truck that is uh, specially built uh, for your operation here. Would you uh, describe this truck to us? 
Well, this truck uh, was just purchased this year, and it's uh, it in our operation. It can be used as a uh, truck to service the harvesters, haul grain from the fields to our own ranch storage, and then it's a specialty truck to haul fertilizer to these big hitch drills and uh, load the drills as fast as possible. Now you see that it has an auger in the bottom and then it has another auger up the side in the rear that is designed to fill these drills as you drive along the back. Uh, dude, in this operation, it's uh, quite important to keep the tractor rolling. You have a big invest investment and uh, you have to have components to go with this type of a, a deal. Well, you combine, Marion, this truck this fertilizer truck with another truck carrying seed to uh, to help in the operation. Though. That's right. Uh, we actually are putting more pounds per acre of fertilizer than we are seed. We don't require quite a large a truck. This truck is operated from a auger in the rear. We raise the dump bed and the auger is, is run by a hydraulic motor that runs from our hydraulic hoist pump. You were mentioning a little while ago some interesting comments about what you've learned in terms of uh, planting this seed dry. You don't wait for the range, you plant dry. Isn't that it? Yes, uh, we've uh, increased our production considerable. I think uh, from probably an average uh, prior to 1960, a 1,500 pound average of barley, uh, including last year's or this last year's harvest, the 1969 crop, we brought it up to a 2,480 pound average. So you see, we have we can really produce, but we need price now, and that's where NFO comes in. For many years, Cal Poly agriculture classes have visited the White Farm to study their equipment and their methods. Now, Marion White's son, Ken, is himself a student at Cal Poly. While we were in Shandon, I talked with Ken about his studies and about the future. But Ken, where are you in school? I'm a senior at Cal Poly, located down here in San Luis Obispo, right near us. And what are you majoring in in school? Uh, my major is mechanized agriculture. I'm kind of fitting it in with the production aspects, and uh, I'm trying to plan my curriculum so I'll gear it towards coming back into our own operation, and my electives, I'm filling it with uh, Ag agriculture business management classes and animal husbandry also since our operation involves grain and cattle. Yes. We're standing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in front of a large combine that uh, the whites call a pusher, the cab of which was designed by Ken as a project in school. Tell us about that. Well, we had to, uh, the pro class was in, in major class, which is uh, Ag Project was the name of it, and we had to initiate a project of our own, design it for a practical purpose in industry or in a ranch or farming operation. So I chose this because uh, I was a combine operator and I'd reap most of the uh, <laughs> comforts of it. So uh, I initiated the project, uh, designed it, and, and assembled it in the class itself, and it involved a one hour lecture and three or six hours of laboratory a week working in the shops, mm -hmm. which is the major portion of the work was the shop work. And it fed it in real well and we brought it back and installed it here at the ranch and I've gone to uh, air conditioning school to learn installation and servicing of air conditioning units. So all of our, we have uh, trucks in here around the shop that uh, have air conditioning units in them and I've learned how to service them. And it, works out real well with our whole total operation. Well, now, in your classes uh, in mechanization, uh, I understand that uh, these classes have come out here to the ranch to uh, get some uh, practical uh, looks at uh, mechanization in large-scale farming. That's correct. We've, uh, the last, uh, I believe it's been 15 years since uh, we've been having classes coming out field trips involved in the production aspects of agriculture and mostly looking over equipment our operations involved here and the time of year that we carry them out and a uh, few of the basics of production and whatnot mm -hmm. mostly uh, most uh, <clears throat> the mechanized part of uh, our operation yes and uh, the basic varieties such as crops and whatnot in contrast to the gigantic farming operation of Marion White in the Shandon, California area, 
Here is an interview at Moses Lake, Washington with NFO member Dave Stevens. Well, Dave, I must declare that this is a beautiful day in Washington State. Well, we arranged it just for you, Bill. I'm glad you did. That's most hospitable. You know, uh, it got down below freezing last night, didn't it? Yeah, well, I got up about uh, 6 this morning. It's 25 degrees. 25 at that time. But, boy, it's clear now and, uh, and warm, and uh, it's a beautiful day. Well, it's kind of typical this time of year. Yeah. It gets pretty cold here, doesn't it, Dave? I mean, uh, through the wintertime, do you have snow and low oh, temperatures? We have our cold uh, times, but generally our winters are uh, quite mild. Fairly mild winters. Fairly mild. How about summertime? Extreme or are they comfortable? They're uh, comfortably extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that yeah, means we, we get some very hot days, yeah. but on on the average in the low 90s, I think. Yeah. But this mm -hmm. is dry country, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. It's dry right. heat and dry cold, right. and uh, very pleasant. And that's pleasant heat and cold yeah. if we have to have it. Dave, uh, how many acres do you farm here? I uh, farm about 900 acres. Here and uh, what are your main crops? Well, sugar beets, uh, potatoes some sweet corn, corn for silage for feeding stock, uh -huh. peas for freezing for human consumption, wheat, you just pasture, about alfalfa. Just about cover it all. Yeah. We're uh, unfortunately here sort of between harvests. Uh, you've just uh, completed uh, one harvest and now you're into the beet harvest and that's about over, isn't it? Well, not for us. We're just beginning. There are some that are on the uh, ending up uh, phase, but uh, mm -hmm. we're just getting started. We have 400 acres to harvest. What kind of uh, beet quality do you have this year? you have good sugar content? Yes, it's uh, normally the sugar content increases a little as the season goes on. The longer the beets are in the ground, mm -hmm. this generally seems to be the case, and I think it's adequate now. They're not unhappy with it. Mm -hmm. However, I think it hasn't, it hasn't proved to be as high as the last year's average was. Now, you're uh, doing some uh, expanding in your cattle operation. Tell us about this. Well, we have a, well, a small herd of uh, registered cows, uh, the McDonald breeding. It's an excellent uh, type. Uh, I think it's the kind that's uh, really the, the coming thing in the, whole, in the uh, Hereford uh, mm -hmm. breeding. Uh, about 65, 70 cows. We have uh, four or five excellent bulls. Uh, we intend to uh, expand this to where we have uh, 150 to 200 cows. Now, uh, in addition to this, we uh, winter calves. We'll have up to about a thousand head of calves. We uh, they do a little foraging in the fields, but mainly we dry lot them and mm -hmm. uh, carry the feed to yeah. them. Well, what sort of expansion is going on over here in your uh, in your feedlot? Well, uh, we are increasing the uh, capacity of the corrals themselves mm -hmm. somewhat, uh, but this is primarily for uh, housing the, uh, or taking care of the uh, registered uh -huh. cattle. Yeah. We're just really getting a start in that. We'll have our bull pens and separate pens for the heifer calves. We noticed some new construction over here at the end of uh, the pens, and that's uh, the makings of a scale, Yes, right? yes, we're installing a, a scale for weighing cattle. What That'll kind of a, a scale, what capacity scale will that be? It'll be a 30-ton uh, 30 uh, 30 uh -huh. capacity, 12 feet by 26 feet. Mm -hmm. And it'll have, uh, it'll be enclosed, so we can run cattle in it. It'll be, uh, the, when the construction is completed there'll be uh, alleyways leading right to the scale so we can just walk them on and off yeah this is irrigation country here yes where we are this is all irrigated and where do where? you get your water out of moses lake of course well my property happens to be or a part of it just on the perimeter of the columbia basin uh, irrigation project mm -hmm. uh, i have about 400 acres that's irrigated or a little less than that irrigated from the uh, water that comes from, that has previously been impounded behind the uh, Grand Coulee Dam. Yeah. It's brought here through a series of uh, canals, equalizing reservoirs and laterals and smaller ditches. How many miles does that water travel when it gets to you? Well, we're 80 miles from the dam and here. And it goes on farther, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. It goes on about another uh, 30 miles south of us. Mm -hmm. A the lot balance, of, excuse oh, me, go ahead. I was just going to say the balance of uh, 
our property. We irrigate from Moses Lake. No. Uh, we're part of an irrigation uh, district formed for this purpose. How many and acres we, in that lake, Dave? Well, I think six to 10,000 acres. Uh, through the years, uh, give most, or take. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you, through the years, most of the farmers in this area have, uh, have taken water from the lake, right? Well, initially, this is where most of the irrigation took place. Uh, there and uh, in the vicinity near to the lake, uh, shallow wells. When I came, first came here 23 years ago, we dug wells on some property on the west side of the lake. And uh, they were shallow wells and uh, good water and an abundance of it. Wherever we go, we like to pick up the local paper to see <laughs> what's going on, you know. And uh, in Moses Lake, we notice in the paper that, uh, that uh, the level of uh, the lake is to be lowered. But uh, we also noticed as a part of the story that the people in charge of such activity have asked anybody in the area who has any objection to the lowering of that level to uh, stand up and be counted. What's that all about? Well, of course, there are other users of the water besides uh, farmers who utilize it for irrigation and uh, principally uh, for recreational purposes. And uh, Many of the uh, residents of our area have built along the lake. Mm -hmm. They have their uh, boat docks, and I suppose they require uh, occasional maintenance and repair, and so it, it facilitates this if they can lower the water level. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, a small dam with some gates on it at the uh, one end of the lake, and they just, uh, toward the end of the season, they lower the lake level. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I think they did this a little prematurely this year because they've lowered the water to where we uh, suddenly found that we had nothing in our channel uh, coming out of the lake <laughs> wow. to boost up the hill to water with. Uh -huh. But uh, they've uh, advertised now, this was made known to them, that uh, uh, this precluded our continuing with the irrigation for the season. Mm -hmm. And I think they hope, uh, I know they hope that uh, they can uh, let the level uh, attain at least a, nearly its previous levels where we can still get water. Yes. You've been here on this particular farm, farming this land, owning this land since the mid-50s. Uh, mm -hmm. What was it like when you first came here, Dave, and how did you come by it? Well, as I say, I'd been here for several years prior to that. Uh, this particular uh, unit where our home stands, uh, farm unit, is in the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project. Uh, the law required that uh, any farm unit be properly conformed in one ownership. One person would be the owner. And uh, for several years after water was available and being delivered to the surrounding farms, this, uh, this particular farm stood uh, undeveloped in sagebrush. And the reason for it, I, I, there had been those who had uh, tried to acquire it. It's in a good area, of close to close to town. Mm -hmm. It's very good soil type, and productive ground. <laughs> but uh, there were about uh, 13 different owners <laughs> of this in small parcels. Yeah. Some of them, uh, two and a half acres, and uh, five acres, and then here a 20, and there a 10. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the owners, was in Egypt. I think one of the others was in Iran. All the rest were just scattered. But we uh, happened along at a convenient time, and uh, these people had been required by the law to uh, pay for the water, uh, and yet the water wasn't uh, deliverable to them because they hadn't completely complied with yeah. the law. So they were ready to sell, we were ready to buy, and we put it together. It worked out we nicely. We developed the ground. You were sort of a charter member of the National Farmers Organization in the state of Washington, as I understand. Well, I tell people I was the first <laughs> one in the state of Washington. You think you I, were? I was at the first organizational meeting held, and I was the, I was the first one to sign up. I, I don't know for sure that I was the first in the state. When was that, Dave? Well, that was in uh, January two years ago. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, NFO is very strong through this county, is it not? Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's grown rapidly and there's some energetic uh, dedicated people in it. How many of the farmers, what percentage do you feel belong to NFO? Well, at one time this summer the, I became aware that there were over 600 uh, members in the county mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I'd say that's probably half or maybe more than half of the and, farms. Uh, how much of the production of the county do you think those members represent? Half the well, production, Well, I would assume, perhaps? yeah, that'd be uh -huh. a probable uh, amount. What first, uh, what first attracted you to NFO? Uh, I, I'd say curiosity. I'd heard of their uh, activities in the Midwest, and I was anxious to know more about it, get a little uh, first-hand information. I, I'm sure that what I had heard wasn't uh, all uh, NFO's uh, side of their controversial picture. So when a meeting was called here, a membership meeting, I attended. It was the first one held in the state. And uh, I had previously been impressed with their uh, the aims of the organization and the methods that they'd used to, or intended to use, to obtain their goals, and mm -hmm. so I just wanted to hear more and mm -hmm. know more about it. And now, as to your production here on your acreage, uh, do you sell it all through NFO? Well, uh, not exactly. Now, of course, you'd understand that we're only uh, two years organized mm -hmm. here. Uh, I probably would uh, off the, just quickly have answered yes, but we, uh, we raise quite a lot of uh, sugar beets here. We have an, an organization that uh, does market them. We, yeah. You see the factory just in the distance there, the sure Utah Idaho Sugar Factory. And, uh, with the exception of sugar beets, I have signed all of my uh, crops into the NFO. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, as soon as uh, something is uh, arranged where they can represent the farmer, that would be my intention to do likewise with the, the sugar beets. Devon, uh, out of deference to you, we did include somebody on our show today from your area. Dave Appreciate Stevens that. of Moses Lake, Washington. A very fine man and a great NFO member, by the way. We think so, Bill. Uh, you and President Orrin Lee Staley, I understand, were at Moses Lake just recently. Yes, we were. You had a meeting there? About a thousand people in the meeting, Bill. Sounds like uh, great enthusiasm in that area for the organization. Successful. Devon, thank you for being my guest today, and on your next trip, uh, let's do it again pleasure's been mine. My special guest on U.S. Farm Report, Mr. Devon Woodland of Idaho. Devon is executive assistant to the field staff department of NFO. U.S. Farm Report is seen each week on this station. Until we meet again, so long everybody. Mm -hmm.